So first of all, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, obviously, we're here to talk about the risks of coastal erosion and the impact on the future of our property market. I'm delighted to be joined today by Tom Backhouse, who is the uh, a, a very well-known and well-regarded geologist and also the CEO and founder of Terra Firma. Obviously, Tom's got a mission to provide accurate information regarding all ground risks to uh, property professionals along with expert opinion. I'm also joined by Sean Reeves, who's a well-established property professional lawyer across the South Coast, passed his LPC or completed his LPC out of Bournemouth University and is now or has been ever since working along the South Coast, which we know has quite a big coastline. So uh, we're going to have a, a conversation today around the risks of coastal erosion. I'm going to pass straight over to Tom, first of all. New, not a new risk. Um, it's been around for a long time, but obviously um, becoming more and more predominant following climate change um, and everything else. So we're going to pass that to Tom just to give us a broad overview of the coastal erosion risk in the UK today. And then we'll have a, a bit of a conversation between the three of us and obviously invite any questions into the chat box as we progress. So Tom, over to you. Cheers, Martin. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us, the three of us. Um, yeah, as, as Martin said, there's, it's, it's not a new, new risk to property to land. Um, we're an island at the end of the day, coastline is, you know, in, in um, surround, the coast surrounds us. Um, and it's, you know, it's intrinsic to our history as a, as a nation as well. And we've, uh, over, you know, for generations, we've had an affinity with the sea, um, using it, you know, fishing and port and transport and trade. Um, but there are parts of the country, not, not everywhere, um, you know, parts of the coastline that are, um, the weather, co the, you know, the erosion is increasing and has been increasing now for the last, um, you know, for the last 30, 40 years. Some parts of our coastline erode faster than anywhere else in Europe. So up in the Humber, for example, um, the Humber side up, up there, up the coast, you know, erosion up to sort of seven meters a year in some locations. Um, and then other parts of the coast, you see the dramatic kind of cliff falls that are around like West Bay, where Broad Church was filmed and, um, and things like that, where, you know, they're, they're, they're much more dramatic and make the news quite regularly. Um, but there's, you know, to be to be clear, this is this obviously doesn't affect all properties. It's 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 only properties you know adjacent to or or within you know the kind of erosion zone or hazard zone of the of the, of the sea. Um, affects around about six hundred and twenty five thousand properties um, in that zone, and every single one of those properties is considered to be at risk of erosion over the next eighty years. So over the last um, or, or sea flooding, um, and they're kind of they're kind of linked in you know kind of intertwined and linked um and as the climate changes now and we've got we're we, we're we're having um you know more and more models produced by the the met office and um and we use those to predict the future of that time's wrong though isn't it oh. Oh. Not sure <laughs> <Somebody> <laughs> hijacking the meeting <laughs> Um, I'll go, I'll go on. So as, as uh, obviously as climate is now changing um, and um, we have scenarios to predict what type of, ch you know, what type of changes might occur, you know, some from one end of the spectrum might be very minor changes if we adapt our, um, our you know, adapt and become sustainable quite quickly in the next decade or, um, you know, kind of runaway climate change, um, which will significantly impact sea level um, and, and obviously coastal erosion. So we predict that forward and, um, and there, you know, there are some parts of the coast, particularly on along the south coast, um, where properties, you know, effectively abut onto um, the beach. Um, you know, have have gardens that ultimately end at the the cliff line or um, end at where you know the the, the beach is, um, and they they're they're at serious risk of um, not just erosion and collapse, but also from you know the impact on value, uh, insurability, um, and though and and of, and of future sale as well. Um, and it isn't just those properties that are directly abutting, um, you know, the cliff line or the beach. It's also the ones that are getting closer and closer to it um, as erosion, you know, uh, sort of takes place in these locations. And and that that kind of diminution in value, the closer they get to the the coast or the, the cliff line, is one that more and more homeowners will have to consider as um, as a as a risk to them over the, the ownership of their property. So if the average ownership is 21 years in the UK, and the average mortgage lifetime is 25 years. You know that 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 period of time, then th there'll be significant changes in the in the coastline, and you know across that that time span. Um, and as solicitors, you know, we we're trying to support solicitors to um, give the, their clients the information they need um, to consider that risk across 
the ownership of the property. Tom, it's, it's an interesting challenge because obviously when, when we talk about all of these risks and, and, and historically, if we go back, we, we think um, contaminated land, we think flood and more recently sort of energy infrastructure, wind farms, um, HS2 and such like. And, and obviously um, the coastal erosion thing is, whilst it's not a new risk, it's, it's possibly now only coming to the forefront of, of uh, Fiona's minds. And in terms of the actual, um, the number, um, I know there was quite a big, uh, hurrah not so long ago about flood and there was a, a, a significant increase in, in um, conveyances ordering flood searches to, to make sure they were covering that risk. Relative to flood as an example, just to give people an idea, what, what sort of um, uh, volume of properties are we, we thinking are potentially affected by erosion? Um, and, and then I'm going to ask Sean if, if uh, you know, if some of his experiences as well. So first of all, question to yourself, Tom, if we consider flood as a barometer, just because it's a very well-known and, and, and well-established risk in the conveyancing process, relative to flood, what sort of percentage of properties might be um, affected by coastal erosion? Yeah, so in, in, included in flood figures are uh, properties that are at risk from coastal flooding. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's, a kind of, there's an overlap there between, uh, between the two. Um, and, you know, again, as I said before, this is, doesn't affect, a, a, um, you know, only does affect the properties, you know, very clearly um, at the coastline. It's, it is a smaller risk than flood. Flood, you know, flood is one that, that ultimately covers, you know, com compose risks of properties all over the country, inland, at, in, at sea. Um, but there's, there's, there's uh, the figures that are banned around by the environment agencies that are about 1.9, just on 2 million properties that are at risk of, of flooding over, you know, any one, any one time. Um, and that that all that and that's you know the the, the forecast potential flood risk into the future. Um, but as I said earlier, the the number of properties that are considered a risk over the next eighty years is around six hundred twenty five thousand. Um, so it is it is it is uh, it is lower than the, the properties that are obviously a risk from flooding. But the I suppose the 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 kind of the, the differences in the hazard itself and the risk itself are quite you know quite substantial. You can't escape necessarily coastal erosion. Where oh, there are there are clearly measures you can put in place to reduce your uh, flood risk, um, and also there are financial mechanisms to support you. So you know particularly insurance and flood re. Whereas with coastal erosion, you know, there, at the moment there currently isn't um, any uh, financial mechanisms to support you. Um, there are projects that are underway at the moment. We're part of a couple of them because the government have announced funding to um, to try and support homeowners in that loca those locations. Um, but there's, you know, you can't escape coastal erosion. You can't you can't stop uh, that that happening. Um, and the other big thing is is the impact on value. Now there have been quite a lot of studies already to show, anecdotally and both both based on science, to show that there is a quite substantial reduction in value um, of properties that are at risk of coastal erosion compared to properties that are at risk of flooding. Um, and the you know the properties at risk of flood do not have that same um, same impact on value. So there are, there are differences. There's a smaller number of properties, but there are differences in how it affects property value and how you how you live in this, live in it. Yeah, I mean it, it's interesting. It, yes, you say there's a, a smaller number, but six hundred plus thousand. I mean we we are still talking broadly speaking around a third of those um, impacted by flood. And flood is obviously something that is is quite. Um, at the forefront of, of many Fiona's minds, for example. So perhaps coastal erosion isn't necessarily something that, that can be taken quite um, so lightly almost by many people, because as you rightly say, if, if, at the end of the day, if your garden falls off the edge of a cliff, it's, it's probably much harder to remediate that than yeah. to put in some flood mechanisms. Sean, just coming over to you there, um, uh, have you had any experiences of coastal erosion in your um, career along the south coast there that yeah, I, I had a client who approached me about a year, 18 months ago, um, and they're, they're based in Eastbourne. And um, after a, a deluge of rain, they actually had part of their uh, back garden fall off down the cliff on top of a promenade um, and on top of the uh, some beach huts that were down there. And what my client wanted to know was where, whose responsibility it was in relation to maintaining um, that that cliff edge because at the time when they purchased the property they weren't aware that one the cliff was unstable and second of all um, whether there was any um, support mechanism there to actually make it more stable and then they again weren't advised as to whose responsibility it was to ensure it and if there was any damage caused who would end up being liable for 
That's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because, it, you know, it does open up a, a, a fairly sort of notable can of worms there when you talk insurability and liability. And from, from your point of view then, Sean, you know, I guess there's no real guidelines at the moment about when we should be reporting on coastal erosion and when we shouldn't be, is there? It's not... It's not no, there, there, there isn't. And in, re, in relation to insurability, my understanding is that most household insurance policies do not cover cliff erosion. Um, so actually, it, it resulted in my client being personally liable for the damage that was caused to the promenade below. The, the, oh, oh, the, so not just for their own property, but for the properties? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. And the beach, beach huts. And then they also then received another bill for about £58,000 uh, £58, to try and make the cliff face stably once again. And so it's true. Is it, is, is it, I think if you, if, you, if, you, if you kind of put all of the hazards that, you know, all the, all of the environmental risks on a spectrum uh, in terms of how they can impact the homeowner, um, you know, in terms of, that financial liability that they are, you know, that they're facing, coast erosion realistically is the is at this extreme, you know, is yeah. that that is, is at the far end of the and that until, you know, basically until 2020, it wasn't being reported on as by inconveniencing, and, and homeowners, you know, ultimately it was their own own prerogative to do that due diligence on for themselves, um, which they could do if they wanted to go on, you know, and look online. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess ultimately, if you want a, a home on the coast and you're buying it for that sea view then probably it's not at the forefront of your mind that that sea view might suddenly get a lot closer to your back door than you thought oh, exactly because i think you know that that's the that's the kind of problem here really is that is that perception issue so you know that pe pe I, I personally would want to live near the coast if i had an opportunity to live as close to the coast as possible i would take that and that's that's what many people buying houses at the coast want you know they want to be have that view they want to be able to be close to the beach um and the, so the value ref, is reflects that perception, but at the end of the day, there's you know that that risk is great enough to cause them you know significant issues. There's, there's a case study in um, literally you can look it up on Google. It's only nine months old. It was in you know, June last year. Property fell off a cliff in uh, East Church in Isla Sheppey. Um, the homeowner bought that place for their family in 2018 for 100 grand, um, and it was they were told when they were then they moved in by the surveyor, not by the conveyancer. Um, that they would have uh, 40 years in that property and you know within that you know they, they um, so that's why they paid obviously less for it so they, they won't have you know they wouldn't be living there forever but 40 years two years later it's gone um, you know and they it's so they it's it, it's it's very clearly affecting people right you know right now right you know at, at the moment um, and it's it's you know it is a risk that if you're moving house just like you're getting information on flood or mining or you know, on contaminated land, you absolutely should be getting the, the relevant information on coastal erosion too. Yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly if, if you put it into perspective of the financial impact, it is, is certainly coastal erosion would seem to be the most catastrophic event imaginable for any, any impact on the ground. Um, Sean, I mean, from, from a Fiona's point of view, um, if you were instructed on a, a, a transaction on the coast there, uh, along the coast there, um, what sort of due diligence might you undertake in terms of um, whether you felt obliged to report on the risk of coastal erosion? It, it would really depend where the property was based, because obviously down in the New Forest where I am, um, you've got the coastline from between Bournemouth and Southampton. There's, a, there's already um, quite a strong um, local authority plan in relation to protection for coastal erosion you know where the air, the problem areas are and um, the the difficulty becomes when you're instructed in an area that you're not so au fait with so say i was instructed uh, further along the coast somewhere in west sussex or uh, east sussex or somewhere like that when i receive a title plan i only have a two-dimensional view of that property and i might see that there's a coastline there but I won't necessarily know if it's on, on, on a cliff top or a cliff edge or, or anything like that. So then that's when you would start to have to review um, other data sources about whether there, there is actually an issue in relation to uh, a, a cliff erosion. So it, I mean, it, it is actually a genuine concern though, isn't it? Because 
you know, as you rightly say, it's very difficult if you were instructed, I mean, for example, if you instructed somewhere along the, um, uh, the East Anglian coastline or something, you, you wouldn't have the local knowledge to know what risks were associated to that. And, and without actually having um, something like a, a ground report on that property, is it just a judgment call then? I mean, is it, I guess, as is often the case, the onus always seems to be passed to the fee owner to make the judgment call. And, and you know, how, I mean, how do you feel about that? If, if you're instructed on the property, you don't know the area, you recognize that it could be close to the coast. To what extent do you feel that you should be investigating and reporting on that ground risk? No, I would always err, err on the cautious side. So if I if I thought there was any any risk to either uh, the client's property or or even the lender's security, because bearing in mind that most clients they make their decision when they're buying a house is an emotional one. Um, so you you can always present risks to them, but most clients they've already fallen in love with the property, so they're going to proceed with it. So then it, it it's then about explaining to the clients those those risks and then also reporting them to the lender so if i if i had uh, uh if something came to my attention then i would automatically report it to the the lender and give them that information and then ask them to make a judgment call the issue you have sometimes is that the lenders aren't necessarily set up in relation to recognizing or even acknowledging these risks so then they will just come back to you and say well if you're happy to submit a clear certificate of title then please proceed mm. to which then i usually i would respond and say well actually it's a matter in relation to the condition of the property therefore you really need to refer it back to your surveyor and get their their professional opinion on it and it's, it's like just, i mean expanding on that slightly just coming back to the, the case you mentioned earlier tom so I guess the um, the lender requirements and, and the, the liability and also the insurability are the, are the big things here. So you mentioned that, that property earlier, 40 years lifespan given by the surveyor. So not inconceivable that a lender may have an appetite to, to provide some funds against that transaction. Falls off the cliff two years later or, or disappears two years later. Who's now liable and who's, who's, who's going to carry the can for this? Because the you mentioned also the insurability factor. I, I'm not sure how well covered people would be with their home insurance in, in that sort of situation, um, whether they're, they're, they're financially still liable, whether it's a lender error, whether the owners would go to the fee owner. What, what, what would your view be on that? Tom? Well, in terms of the um, property that fell off the cliff in East Church, they, they, weren't, um, they had no insurance in place either, so the insurance didn't cover them either. So they were entirely financially liable for that. They lost... Um, they had uh, they had contents insurance and so that you know, but um, so they got a new TV, but they lost their house. Absolutely, and if you've seen the photo, if you've seen the photos of it, it's pretty dramatic. Like the car fell off the cliff, and you know it's it's, um, but the the uh, the the you know the, the the difficulty is, as I sort of said earlier, is that there are at the moment there are really no financial sort of safeguarding, you know, it, sort of measures in place for these for people living in these properties. The the that, you know, they, the problem is as well is that the number of people that currently live in properties at the coast, and then when they go to sell them in the next, let's just say, in the next five years or something like that, there's going to be a real shift change in the way the lender uh, views those properties as well. So, you, you know, you may or may not be aware, but the lenders this year have been forced by regulation to look at their portfolios to understand the risks to them in the future. They, you know, they they are being literally regulatory pressured into that. So. They, over the next 12 to 18 months, they're going to be looking at all these properties they've got in the portfolios and going, well, these ones are actually like going to come up. They're going to red flag them. Um, and when they go to, you know, when that property goes to sale and sell in the future, then that, that you know, the, I agree with Sean, they probably at the moment aren't set up to, to understand or acknowledge that risk, but they certainly will be in the next, in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and, you know, th therefore, just as with other environmental risks, you know, there's a kind of synergy between the lender and the conveyance and understanding those risks and the surveyor, coast erosion is now going to follow that uh, same sort of pattern. And, you know, it, it, uh, just, just the same with those conveyances really ought to be providing that information to, um, to their client. Um, and if, especially if the lender is as aware as, you know, as, as they are. Um, so the, the, it's, it's a really tricky one. It's one that can't necessarily be solved. That there are, as I said, there are some sort of projects at the moment to look at working with insurers to almost put in place something 
think like flood re but for coastal erosion so you know supporting homeowners uh, move to move incentivizing them to move in certain locations because they potentially will lose their property you know, to put in some context about how many properties are expected to be lost uh, since 1900 some of the research we undertook last year showed that around about 3,000 properties were actually fully you know total loss to the sea in the next 25 years there's supposed to be around about 6,000 lost to the sea and that includes places like Fairbourne um, in Wales where the whole village is supposed to be abandoned and things like that so it's a massive increase in the number of properties that's supposed to be lost to the sea in the next literally 25 years which is a mortgage lifetime so yeah I think there's there, there's going to be a rapid realization across the check you know across the parties involved in, in property purchase that this is something that just has to be treated uh with the with the kind of um respect that it deserves um so i, ma I imagine with, with all of that then the insurability element is, is going to become critical isn't it because if you've got um well we have got coastal erosion we know we've got coastal erosion but if you've got um a cliff edge that's uh, let's say we've got an 80 year lifespan before the erosion reaches the, the property um, with everything that passes, that insurability diminishes, surely, because, you know, 10 years from now, now I've only got 70 years until it goes and, and, and 20 years, only 60 years. And, and that must be a huge problem for the insurance industry to, to actually. They're not, as it currently stands, they're not set up to be able to, you know, to kind of um, to underwrite those types of risks, which is exactly why they uh, are now there's, there's, there's these projects in place to try and, you know, enable insurers to do that. Um, and it's a similar. It's, it's, it is similar to, to what's been occurring in flood over the last few years with like move to parametric insurance of, uh, around flood risks. Um, and a, a, a similar kind of process needs to be put in place for properties at the coast now. Um, and you know, there, as I said, there, there are different types of erosion risks at the coast. You know, you can have very rapid erosion where you know the property gets very close to the cliff line very quickly, or you can have ones that, as you, you know, as you just alluded to, slowly, slowly get closer and closer. But that that's going to you know impact on on value and ultimate saleability when they go and try and sell it again. So they have to have that insurance um, kind of solution in place. And again, I suppose as a direct consequence of, of that, coming back to Sean again, if, if you're instructed on a transaction on the coast, you you have to start thinking about this now about um, the, the very real risk that a client might purchase a property and then find that they have issues with insurance, similar to what we had previously prior to flood re. Um, that there might be other issues of liability if that um, property does diminish rapidly in value, um, similar to what, what Tom alluded to earlier about something that was unexpected, unforeseen. Um, and I suppose it, 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 until we actually get some clear guidance from um, the SRA or Law Society, um, or we have a practice note re relating to coastal erosion, the onus is very much on the fee owner to, to take a judgment call, is it? Is, is, I mean, is it that certainly is, and that's why I always advise clients uh, pretty much on the onset of a purchase instruction to start looking in relation to buildings insurance and putting insurance in place, at least getting a quote so that they, they are fully aware of what, uh, what the costs are likely to be. Um, and in these type of areas, they probably would need to go to see a, a, a broker or a, or, or a specialist broker because going on confused.com or compare the market or anything like that, they're not geared up for these specialist no. policies. They're, they'd be fine for properties that are inland, but these, these properties which are on, on the, uh, near the cliff edge, as it were, they're going to need special bespoke policies and they're going to need someone to really go through all the finer details. And as such, the sooner they do that, because there's nothing worse that when you're coming up for two exchange contracts, that then you're waiting for your client to scrabble around to try and get insurance put in place, because that's likely then when they're going to go on to compare the market or, 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 or a comparison site like that. It's just to pick up on that point. So the, the, the biggest problem that property owners are going to uh, face is not, the, is not actually a problem. I mean, they have an immediate issue where they have a, a garden you know, backing onto a cliff line. It's the properties that are, you know, sort of 50 meters inland that, you know, probably right now a convincer or lender and an insurer would consider them inland and at not at risk. Um, they're the ones that are at the most risk in terms of like, if, if you moved in now, then your insurance, you'd probably be able to get insurance. Um, and you would, you know, your lender probably wouldn't have red flag as a problem. And a conveyance might not pick up that there's an issue. 
But if they're living there, you know, this is that kind of foresight um, of risk that might not readily occur currently within conveyancing. But being able to, you know, being able to kind of acknowledge and understand that those properties will become at risk potentially within 10, 15, 20 years, which is likely the ownership of their property, you know, the property. So when they go to try and sell it again, or even when they're in, you know, even within the ownership and they have to try and insure it in 10, 15 years' time, if the property is in front of collapsed or they've significantly reduced in value, then that will that will impact the way that they sell and live in that property. And they're they're the they're the properties that really do need that um sort of notification upon, upon sale now. Well I would I would assume there's also the other nuances there of, of if you have a, a, a property, a coastal property, but technically inland, as you say, for the yeah. purposes of insurance and, and liability and such. Now, if, if you start to experience erosion on that property, perhaps there's a neighbouring property. At, at what point, and I'm, I'm speculating here, but I'm guessing it's fairly unclear and vague, but at what point does the liability end? I mean, if, if, your, if your garden falls into the cliff and takes part of your neighbour's garden with it, who, who, who's yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 sure, it's, it sounds like an absolute minefield to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's not going to be... Um... It's not going to be simple to come up with a, you know, with an answer to, to who's who's liable there. Um, and I mean, if it, all you've got to do is speak to, you know, all you've got to do is speak to people that live in the communities around, like particularly in like the hump, you know, in the Humber side, the, the Humber side, Humber coastline, um, and within sea and places like that, where, you know, the the coast is eroding into properties, got in property gardens literally every day. And, and I mentioned earlier, Sean mentioned earlier the, the the fence scheme and the shoreline management plan in 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 and around where he works and obviously they are absolutely essential to, to, to you know to defend properties but they're being overtopped all of the time you know literally all the time you know again like these wind is an example the um the the, the fences there are, are currently under review to you know to, to understand you know to look at how they're going to be able to be fortified because they're, they're just being completely overtopped um and and so just relying purely on that information so you know that there is a management plan there or there's a there's the fences there does not mean that there isn't an isn't a risk and all of those things need to be considered uh, together to be able to give like a you know a, a proper assessment of risk at that uh, property level yeah it's interesting that's for sure and it's um I, I think it's certainly we'll watch this space carefully won't we because it's definitely something that's going to become more um, apparent in the coming years as, as insurers start to look at it more carefully and, and lenders also um, that, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that and your thoughts, Tom. Sean, is there, uh, there anything else that you've got that you'd like to, to add about this whole thing? Um, I'm conscious that we're, we're getting close to time and people want to get on. So before we invite questions, just if, um, Sean, you've got any? No, I, I've got nothing further to add. Fabulous. Tom, any, any, any closing comments there before we invite questions? Um, no, other than, um, you know, just, just like the other environmental risks that are covered in conveyancing, they do have practice notes. So I think this is something that, that the industry does need to um, approach the likes of SOA and the society to, to kind of ask those questions about how they're going to support conveyances because you know they they do this is something that they do need to support their members on and you know to understand um, and give them the guidance and the you know the pra best practice that they, they need to make the right decisions. So it isn't just a pure judgment call. Yeah absolutely I, I, I think you know it, I'll be very surprised if we don't see a practice note emerge at some time in the not too distant future, because it is clearly a, a, a it's quite a catastrophic risk for many people. And um, whilst it doesn't affect vast swathes of the country, it's still a significant number of, of properties at risk. So yeah. fantastic. So, so Sean and Tom, thank you so much. That's, that's really insightful. Um, I'm just going to open up to our, um, our, our guests and ask if there's any questions out there now for us to ask for Tom or Sean. Any questions, anybody? So I, I don't seem to be getting anything coming through at the moment. Obviously, that's because you've both given such <laughs> feedback on the coastal erosion topic and subject matter. So we'll, we'll wrap up. But if any of our guests do think of questions later on, please do feel free to contact myself at TM or Tom at Terra Firma. And I'm sure Sean would be happy to, to share his thoughts as well. So please contact us if you have questions. We'll feed them on to Sean or Tom for their, their uh, uh, opinions and views on that. Other than that, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you found the 
uh, the discussion useful and we look forward to seeing you on our next TMTV roundtable discussion. Thanks everyone and have a good afternoon. Hey everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.